Tonight, we're blessed to have uh, Dr. Michael Carlin with us, and he's going to walk us through what medieval work talks, teaches us about coaching boys soccer. That was a joke, so <laughs> it's late. Dr. Carlin is an alumnus of Williams College, where he studied history and completed his master's over at Fordham in medieval studies, and then completed his doctorate on the care of souls in the 12th century court of Lyon. He has taught at ASU, Benedictine, Ave Maria, and now we're happy to have him here at the University of Mary. He is a devoted husband, and most importantly, the father of four of the, just the greatest girls I've ever met besides my own there. Filled with great joy and love for their father and for the Lord, Mary, Lucy, Finn, and Marcella. If you ever doubt the goodness, beauty, and truth in this world, just meet his four daughters there in absolute joy. So please join me in welcoming the father of Mary, Lucy, Finn, and Marcella, Dr. Mark Carlin. Are you picking me up here? Yes. All right. Well, um, I have the unenviable position of being a lecturer speaking after an orator. Um, did, did you even look down at your notes? I, I don't know how frequently I will be looking up at you after this moment, so get a good look at me and uh, keep that image firmly in your mind. Um, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, my collaborators. It is indeed necessary that we take opportunities such as this to contemplate the meaning of our work together in this vineyard. Some of you have traveled a good distance to be here among us and offer your distinct voices to this important discussion. Medieval man about whose vision of work I am to speak comes to us from an immeasurably greater distance across centuries of occasional neglect and obfuscation. I must then speak not just as a representative of medieval man, but rather also as selector, editor, interpreter of medieval tradition on the meaning of human work. Let us begin as is fitting for our medieval brethren with a memento mori. It is the work of your mercy, all-powerful, ever-eternal Father God, to pray for those who can no longer be with us. Centuries of medieval Christians since at least the seventh century would have heard this prayer at the burial of their friends and family. In this last goodbye, they are reminded that their work of prayer for the beloved is indeed worthy and ordained by God's mercy. Their work here cooperates in some way with the eternal work of, God's, of God for man's salvation, looking forward to the soul's union with its creator. Now let us leap forward almost a millennium and hear the testimony of another European Christian. If you were nothing but good works from the soles of your feet to the crown of your head, you would not be worshiping God, nor fulfilling the first commandment. This is not done by works, but only by faith of heart. It is not by working, but by believing that we glorify God and confess him to be true. Works, since they are irrational things, cannot glorify God. The 16th century Christian here quoted is, of course, the Augustinian friar Martin Luther. Luther's theological position on the question of faith and works had implications for subsequent historians' views of medieval Christianity, especially its contributions to an understanding of man's work. Medieval man's gospel of works, the criticism goes, focused the meaning of work so completely on the next life that the work by and for people in this life was deplored, resulting in a millennium of technological and scientific inertia. And this view remains the norm among the chattering dilettantes of the 21st century. And those specialists began chipping away at it in the mid 20, even though the specialists began chipping away at it in the mid 20th century. 
It was precisely the historians of technology who first began the reappraisal of medieval technology and the medieval valorization of work. What these historians, and I think of people like Lynn White, Lewis Mumford, and others working in their field, what these historians all agreed on was that we must look to the monasteries where contemplation on the next life and the work of prayer for the dead were undertaken with the greatest dedication. We must look there to discover a new recognition of human labor as not merely an expiation for sins, but as salvific by means of its graced worldly achievements. Christianity inherited and developed the distinction between the servile and higher arts that's implicit in Plato's Republic, uh, Book 7, which implied a hierarchy of thinking over making. Uh, to over, to uh, clarify in gross terms, obviously. Uh, it also inherited a god, however, who was a maker and who made man in his own image, assigning the first people work to do in a state of prelapsarian innocence and perfection. Origen and other Greek fathers seized on this in their scriptural commentaries to note that work is part of God's design for man and not a consequence of the fall. According to Origen, man was created in God's image but achieved likeness to God by the consummation of work upon the earth as a matter of choice. Although other traditions, especially in North Africa, saw work precisely as the signature curse of the fall, the identification of work as the likeness of God first entered the monastic tradition in the fourth century rule of St. Basil. Basil insists that his monks combine prayer and labor as simultaneous modes of praise to God, enjoining that they chant while toiling with their hands. Augustine likewise enjoins his community to combine work with prayer, in keeping with his celebration of human anthropology that no part of the body has been created for the sake of utility, which does not also contribute something to its beauty. Fifth century monastic theologian John Cassian represents a consistent trend in monastic theology in enjoining work of the hands for his monks to combat asedia or spiritual sloth. Monastic rules now are documents both practical, meeting specific needs in the regulation of communal life, and theological, offering a vision of spiritual perfection to animate the community's efforts. Cassian's legislation certainly shows an understanding of what we might recognize as human nature. It should come as no surprise that, the most, uh, that most subsequent monastic rules contained a similar injunction to physical labor as a remedy for spiritual sloth. Now, pivotal in our story was Benedict's integration of work into his rule for months, since the Benedictine rule was to become by far the most widely diffused monastic rule of the Latin West. Of course, most of us are familiar with the Benedictine formula of ora et labora. But let us look more carefully at the terms in which Benedict values the work of his monks. In the prologue to his rule, Benedict thus encourages his monks. See how the Lord in his love shows us the way of life. Clothed then with faith and the performance of good works, let us set out on this way with the gospel for our guide that we may deserve to see him who has called us to his kingdom. If we wish to dwell in the tent of this kingdom, we will never arrive unless we run there by doing good deeds. Later, near the end of this prologue, he adds, what is not possible to us by nature, let us ask the Lord to supply by the help of his grace. If we wish to reach eternal life, even as we avoid the torments of hell, then, while there is still time, while we are in this body and have time to accomplish all these things by the light of life, we must run and do now what will profit us forever. The works and devotions to follow, prescribed so minutely and practically, 
are here given an eternal horizon. It is precisely by the works in community that the, indivi that the individual monks may run toward their salvation. These works do not merely keep the devil from turning idle hands to his purposes, but advance monks to salvation as part of a community. Consider the apportionment of tasks among the brothers. It has been noted that Benedictine monasteries were among the first enterprises in the early Middle Ages to systematically practice division of labor and skilled specialization in their workforces. Yet, even as monks were encouraged to perfect and use their skills, the rule ensures that these efforts do not create a system of classes within the monastery. There's not a sort of caste system that develops. For example, Benedict is quite insistent that skilled artisans are to be reprimanded for any demonstration of personal pride in their handiwork. In the Benedictine rule, all brothers are necessary, yet no one is indispensable. The Burgundian monastery of Cluny is famous for having created a religious order based on the Benedictine rule. They converted the rule from a norm to an order. And they spread over hundreds of dependencies and affiliates throughout Europe and the Holy Land. Part of what drove its explosive growth was the occasionally menacing urgency of its prophetic eschatology, or focus on the last things, both individually and collectively. Cluny took the eschatology already pregnant in the Benedictine rules injunction to run and do now what will profit us forever, and developed it into an institutional structure that involved laity as a, the laity as investors, patrons, spiritual wards, beneficiaries of prayers, masses, and other devotions, and ultimately as full brothers in death. The 12th century monk Bernard of Cluny perfectly encapsulates the appeal. There are some who, by distributing their goods among the poor, hope to redeem their sins and act with this thought. Some men, seeing death approaching them, and knowing they led evil lives, are smitten with terror and bitterly ask themselves how they can better it. Listen, wretch. Listen and wake up. Wake up from fear, if not from love. Consider, therefore, the tortures you will feel in all their keenness to your very marrow in death. We who possess this world's goods ought to have expended them thoroughly for those in need. Let us then, my brethren, be roused. Let us be roused by the counsel of the Lord to spend upon the poor. And spend they did, serving, according to one estimate, approximately 7,000 meals a year to the destitute. This in the 11th century in uh, a town in Burgundy. This signal work of social service was seamlessly integrated with the Abbey's liturgical life, coinciding with major feasts of the monastic calendar, and accompanied with chant and prostrations on the part of the monks serving the poor. Caring for the poor was itself an act of cult by these monks on behalf of their lay benefactors whom Bernard had encouraged to likewise effectively prostrate themselves through extravagant donations to Cluny. This point is key. For the monks at Cluny, there was no distinction between the practical needs of the poor they fed or the rich on whose behalf they prayed and fed the poor. Both were equally in need of God's mercy, God's mercy which began on earth in the monk's own cloister and gave a foretaste of the end times. Cluny produced its own version of the Book of Life in Apocalypse chapter 3, in the form of the so-called necrologies of all her donors and affiliated monks. Organized according to the calendar, these books listed the names of the dead brethren on the dates of their deaths for effective prayers and suffrages. 
One surviving ne necrology from a Cluniac dependency has over 9,000 such entries. For Cluny and her affiliated brothers, lay and professed, the Book of Life was already being written here and now by the pious work of the monks. Cluny's liturgical life was the fusion reactor that fueled an astonishing range of innovations in the high Middle Ages. Cluny's leading role in the development and spread of Romanesque architecture and the rebirth of sculpture is now acknowledged as the consensus view of art historians. The new style was, in part, an architectural expression of the splendid liturgy Cluny spread to her dependencies, as exemplified by the Feast of All Souls, November 2nd, coming up, which Abbot Adilo of Cluny established in the 11th century. On this day, Cluny not only prayed for all the souls that sought her intercession, but any souls in purgatory. It was thus also a celebration of Cluny's self-understanding as foremost intercessor for the souls of all. The monks understood this ambitious project had to be supplied with food and amply financed to do its work. So Cluniac monasteries are thought to have been principally responsible for the rediscovery and refinement of the windmill in medieval Europe. In his seminal study of the growth of monetary economy in the Middle Ages, Lester Little focuses on Cluny as the most important 11th century advocate of the profit economy. In developing fairs and markets, regularizing measurement and prices in cities, wherever they had their dependencies. Indeed, it took a Cluniac accountant to bring order to the 12th century papal finances. They learned from Cluny. Uh, crop rotation and seasonal astronomical prognostications also helped feed the ongoing battle for souls at Cluny. Cluny's role in spreading the Roman rite to the recently reconquered realm of Leon and Castile is also well known and underlines how great an impact Cluny's organization of cult had on the unification and integration of the European periphery. Although Cluny seemed to its medieval contemporaries as a sort of liturgical specialist, these innovations that served her cultic life quickly spread far beyond the monastic domain. New ways of working and organizing work and commerce spread, as did a new integration of work and spiritual life. Cluny's focus of prayer as the work par excellence, or as the monks themselves would say, the very work of God, was equally influential. In the generation after Cluny's propagation of the Feast of All Saints, we can observe new monastic movements invigorated by the so-called Vita Apostolica, or vision of the Church of the Apostles living a common life of prayer and charity. Institutionally, then, this movement was most evident, this movement inheriting from Cluny, was most evident in the canonical reform of the secular priesthood in which priests and cities were living according to the rediscovered rule of St. Augustine, embracing poverty and communal life and liturgy. Marching along with the canons, lay Christians in unprecedented numbers increasingly came to demand liturgical intercession for the souls of their dead. And the canons responded to this demand, offering masses and prayers for the souls of Christians of more modest means. It's been uh, certain medievalist wags will, will say that the Augustinian canons were sort of the, uh, the Walmart of liturgical intercession in the high Middle Ages. Uh, the sort of low-cost alternative to get uh, goods, in this case liturgical intercession, that will do precisely the same thing for their beloved dead. The canons also extended Cluny's liturgically infused charity to, fo to focus specifically on caring for pilgrims and other travelers who had need of food and a place to stay. A liturgical axis of their efforts was the weekly mandatum ceremony, every Saturday, in which the canons would wash the feet of the travelers who were staying with them while chanting Christ's final testament to his apostles from the Gospel of John. Mandatum novum do vobis 
ut diligitas in vicem sicut dilexivos. I give you a new commandment, that you love each other as I have loved you. Christ makes this command of his apostles at the Last Supper in view of his impending death, resurrection, and ascension. It is to be the counsel for their common life until he comes again at the end of days. Far from enervating neglect, monastic eschatology was a powerful agent of change in the Middle Ages. Within this spiritual economy, human work became not merely good, but divinized, serving as a necessary part of the foretaste of heaven and a means of inscribing one's name in the book of life. Contrary to Luther's polemic, the monks offered not a gospel of works, but rather an opportunity to integrate human work into the lived gospel of a vita apostolica. So what can we moderns learn from the monks and their lay collaborators? Tempted as we may be to rebuild the ruined choirs of Cluny, destroyed by the French Revolution, Ours must not be an archaeological enterprise. We, we work together in ways unimaginable to our medieval predecessors, in a world that no longer recognizes its place beneath the sacred canopy. Outside of the University of Mary offices, chanting the Mandatum is typically not appreciated as an integral part of a board meeting. <laughs> Alas. Yet now more than ever, the church must clearly proclaim the common destiny of humanity as rooted in our creation. We were made for eternity, invited by our creator to collaborate with him. The work world is the domain of the laity, and it is ours to evangelize. Against the assault of coarse nihilism, Catholic men and women in the workplace must evidence an alternative vision of human flourishing that does not require assaults on human dignity. Benedict established a community to offer support for his monk's quest for spiritual perfection. We likewise should not attempt to go it alone. Fellowship of Catholic professionals is an essential support. Without this sense of common enterprise, it can be easy to sink into a perception that our faith is a maverick individuality that must assert itself against a conformist tide of secular disdain. Understandable. But this is as much a perversion today as it was in Benedict's day. Ours is a community of believers that spans not only the world, but links age to age. Lay movements have a key role to play in this work of support. The medieval monastic vision of work makes an important stipulation here. Meaningful fellowship, though, and meaningful work all begin in communal worship. It is in the liturgy that we are reminded of the true universality of our community and the value of our work. As the Catechism makes clear, the Mass is a foretaste of the end which God has prepared for all of us. In praying the Mass together, we cooperate in work that is already, at that moment, eternal. A worthy liturgy without individualistic, banal self-indulgence shows this fact more effectively. Cluny's extensive elaboration of its cultic life was not an alternative to work in the world, but the beginning and end of that work, a vision of its final cause. We, no less than the monks, can find the liturgy, find in the liturgy of daily prayer and the Mass, a spirituality not distracting from our work life, but one that centers our work on the true destiny of all human work, the inscription of our names in the Book of Life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlin. Um, if you'd all just take off your shoes, you would like to wash your feet. So. <laughs> now, thank you all for coming tonight.